I'm going to begin with an event that I also described at the AGM in June on my election as president. This was back in the early 1990s, while I was a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley. In my latter years in Berkeley, I was funded by a scholarship from Intel, through which I had the opportunity to meet Intel co-founder Gordon Moore. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the tech sector, Gordon Moore is revered as the great visionary of the sector. He is the originator of Moore's Law, which has driven the progress of technology for more than half a century now. San Jose, where this particular event was held, and Dublin, are sister cities, and the Sister City Programme was presenting its annual Spirit of Ireland Award to Gordon Moore in recognition of Intel's recent investment in Ireland. The transformative potential of this investment was very clear. Minister Mary O'Rourke, who attended the event, spoke with great passion of her excitement as she watched the Intel construction site make progress as she passed it week by week on the train. Tom McHenry, the mayor of San Jose, used a term that day that has stuck in my mind. He spoke of our national tendency towards euphemism, with the Second World War described as the emergency and the Northern conflict, the troubles. He proposed that Ireland should view the time in which he spoke, the early 1990s, as the opportunity. I have never experienced a sense of opportunity as palpable as it was in that room that day. The room packed with industry leaders from around Silicon Valley, all of them hungry to know more about Ireland and how their business could get involved there. The next three decades would see Ireland grab that opportunity and run with it, not just in the tech sector, but also in others, such as pharmaceuticals, advanced manufacturing and med tech. This has transformed the country economically and socially and kept us afloat through the two major crises of the past decade and a half. We've come to take for granted what has been an extraordinary success story. To take a few examples from just one industry, med tech, 80% of global stent production, 75% of global orthopaedic knee production, and 33% of global contact lens production come out of Ireland. These are astonishing numbers. This transformation in Irish industry over recent decades, particularly as a result of foreign direct investment, FDI, is the topic that I want to address this evening. I want to consider some of the factors that brought it about and where we are now positioned as we look forward. Why have I chosen this topic for my presidential address? First of all, and from a personal point of view, because it has been the unfolding context for my entire professional career, and it is a privilege to be able to reflect on it and discuss it with the membership of Engineers Ireland. But there are bigger reasons why I think this reflection is timely and important. One of them is about looking back. Next year, we will celebrate the centenary of the foundation of the Irish state. It will be time to look back not only on the events of 100 years ago, but also at the country we have become since that time. In that context, I recently saw a quote from a paper by Patrick Carroll of UC Davis that resonated with me. States must be imagined, but they must also be built. Next year, as we rightly look back on those who imagined the state, we must also consider those who built it in every sense of that word. For much of the lifetime of the state, that process of building has been dominated by the state interventions and vigorous responses from multiple stakeholders that propelled a small peripheral country into the front line of technology, of globalization, and of the open economy model. I think it is important to remind ourselves of the proportion of our history since independence that is encompassed by this period. The time since Intel's investment represents around a third of the lifetime of the state. T.K. Whitaker's economic development, the document that set the stage, came another 30 years before that. In other words, for most of the lifetime of the state, we have set out our stall as an open, free trading economy, targeting the most competitive global industries. This is now part of who we are. The success of these industries in Ireland is an Irish success story. What delivered this success was not, as it is often described, an economic miracle. Nor was it, as the title of Roy Foster's book on the period might suggest, 
the luck of the Irish. Instead, it derived from visionary decisions, hard work, talented and committed individuals, and multiple elements of a connected system pulling together. It was also down, in very large measure, to engineers. Clearly not only to engineers, individuals from a great diversity of backgrounds combined to build this success. But I would argue that the engineering profession is the one most distinctively associated with Ireland's industrial transformation over recent decades. It was engineering that spawned and continues to drive electronics, communications, computing, medtech, advanced manufacturings, manufacturing, and others among the industry sectors that Ireland has targeted with such success. Engineers are essential across all of these sectors, designing and delivering processes, products, and infrastructures. The availability of engineers is a signifier and a differentiator internationally among countries competing for foreign direct investment. We're starting to see books come out on Ireland's industrial transformation, a great example being Pat McCarthy's History of the Irish Pharmaceutical Industry, which covers all aspects of the development of the industry in Ireland from the perspective of one who was personally involved. I hope that we see more of these accounts as we look to tell the whole story of an extraordinary time for Ireland. Because, and this is one of my main messages this evening, I believe that all who have played a role in Ireland's industrial transformation, and that includes Ireland's engineering community at the front and centre, need to tell with clarity and pride the story of how this success was earned. Otherwise, we allow a narrative to take hold, both internally and externally, that minimises and misrepresents what we achieved and clouds what we can achieve into the future. We're living at a time of great disruption, with major geopolitical shifts, economic nationalism, Brexit, post-pandemic changes to how we live and work, and the impacts of climate change and of digitalisation. These all have major implications for Ireland and for Irish industrial policy. This is my second message this evening, that it is now a time to think very strategically about where we go from here. I want to take a little time this evening to look back in order that we can better look forward. The starting point for Ireland's current industrial positioning is generally taken to be in 1958, when T.K. Whitaker, Secretary of the Department of Finance, produced his landmark report, Economic Development, arguing that Ireland needed to make a dramatic transition and become a free trading, exporting economy. By coincidence, Vintner O'Toole has a new book out just today, We Don't Know Ourselves, a personal history of Ireland since that year, 1958, including his take on Whitaker's work and its consequences. This painting from Sean Keating also dates from 1958. It will be familiar to many of you, as it hangs in the library here in Clyde Road. Its original title, which I think is interesting, is Dei Ex Machina, but this was later changed to the title under which we know it today, The Key Men. It harks back to Keating's earlier work on the Shannon Scheme and Pula Fuca, as he, in an evocative description from Patrick Gallagher, watched the future claw through the mud of his own place. Those works by Sean Keating portrayed the electrification of Ireland as an icon of modernisation and nation building in the early years of the state. At the same time, the industrial policy of the state from the 1930s on was based on protectionism in support of self-sufficiency and the development of indigenous industry. This Vida Fall election leaflet from 1937 provides a good illustration of this policy. It showcases what it describes as the amazing and widespread development of industry over the previous five years, with a focus on flour mills, turf co-ops and clothing. By the late 1950s, this protectionist industrial policy had very visibly reached the end of the road, setting the stage for Whitaker and his modernising vision. Mary Daly and others pull no punches in their descriptions of the general calibre and ambition of private firms in Ireland at that time, living comfortably in a highly protected market with no ambition to produce more sophisticated products 
or develop exports. In her book, 60s Ireland, she describes how many firms were family owned with succession determined by birth, family networks and old school tie rather than education and ability. Tom Cox, in his 1969 history of the Irish Management Institute, described the detritus of three decades of protection, small scale units, little specialization, short production runs, plant underutilization, poor design, scarcely any R&D, and negligible marketing. Of course, there were some exceptions to this. And separately and notably, several of the more commercial state enterprises of the time showed a very high level of ambition and dynamism and attracted leadership talent that perhaps did not see a pathway in private enterprise nationally. But all in all, the level of enterprise in Ireland at this time was not suggestive of a country about to propel itself into the most competitive reaches of global industry. Looking at other elements of our system, at the time of Whitaker's report, we were still the best part of a decade away from the introduction of free secondary education in Ireland. In 1963, just 4% of school leavers went on to third level education. On research, Mary Daly quotes the 1966 OECD report, Science and Irish Economic Development, which suggested that in Irish universities, research was primarily a private passion carried out by individual scholars with little institutional support. Most projects were conducted by less than one full-time researcher. Government spending on research was a fraction of other OECD countries, and two thirds of this went on agriculture, most of it to government institutions. The 1967 report of the Commission on Higher Education included a statement from Common and Nilthori. Our average man, or which we read engineer, all in all is not quite so good at graduation plus 15 years as his continental counterpart. The report also described how over 80% of engineers in Ireland worked in the state sector, whereas in continental Europe, over 80% were employed in industry. The 1966 census recorded five women engineers and 2,878 men. Mary Daly recounts how in 1960, the IDA office in New York was staffed only by a secretary who mailed brochures to interested companies. I think it's important to note all this and to think about how much very hard work it was going to take to realise Whitaker's vision. The building blocks that would support later economic success had to be put in place one by one, and by necessity, it took time. By the time I was going through primary school in the 1970s, we learned in geography class a list of Irish industries, carpets in Naval and Yall, sh sugar in Carlow, Mallow, Thurlis and Tuam, and so on. You can trace a direct line from that list to the one I showed earlier from the 1930s, but the line to Irish industry of today is scarcely evident other than through the children educated in those classrooms. So what were those building blocks that brought us along this journey? The two that are always immediately identified are tax and talent. On tax, it is absolutely clear that the 12.5% corporation tax, along with other elements of the national tax environment, has been a key differentiator for Ireland. As well as the level of this tax, the relative simplicity and, and stability of our corporate tax regime have helped to position it as a central element of our national brand. It also set out a clear national commitment to welcoming foreign direct investment and providing a supportive environment. One problem with the strength of taxation policy as a component of our national offering is that too many people, both within and outside the country, have come to believe that it is our national offering. Another problem is the extent to which we have come to rely on the fruits of this taxation policy. Given the likelihood of changes in the global taxation environment, we need to assess the other enablers of national industrial success, to be confident that they are robust and to underpin strategic choices. So what can we say about talent? The smiling Irish talent pipeline has been another central element of our brand since the days of the young Europeans. But every country has talented young people. Can we realistically continue to claim talent as a differentiator? I think we can, for a variety of reasons, and I want to dwell for a little on this. 
First of all, I think we've been extremely well served by the quality and responsiveness of Irish higher education institutions over a period that has seen a massive increase in higher education participation nationally. The percentage of school leavers going on to higher education has risen from the 4% I quoted earlier to more than 60%, though I do have to note that higher education funding has not kept pace with student numbers. The formation of our graduates has been enriched through periods of international study, through programmes like Erasmus, and industry internships in programmes aligned with the Bologna Declaration. In the area I know best, engineering education, it has been an absolute joy to witness the talent, energy, creativity of students and the ongoing success of former students. People like Dave Burke, VP of Engineering at Google, and Steve Wheeler, just appointed MD of SSE Renewables. We attract great students into engineering and related professions in Ireland, and we give them an excellent and rounded education that develops their transferable as well as their technical skills. I think we should note with pride the role that Engineers Ireland plays in this, through the STEPS programme that does so much to build student interest in engineering, and through the accreditation activities that support the quality and international recognition of our degrees. It's also very important to note the central importance of outstanding technicians to our workforce. This is a cohort without which industry in Ireland could not function, but it does not get the attention that it deserves. Since around the year 2000, when Ireland took a step change in its support for research with the foundation of the Irish Research Council and Science Foundation Ireland and the transformational programme for research in third level institutions, the formation of talent through research has been an inherent part of our talent strategy nationally. This is a vital element of the talent pipeline for countries targeting leading edge industries, producing research trained graduates with an advanced skill set and a creative mindset. A strong research funding environment also allows us to attract and develop internationally leading faculty in areas of strategic significance, where through a multiplier effect, they train further generations of undergraduates and researchers. An example of this is my colleague, Professor Bogdan Stasetsky, an international leader in microelectronics, who was attracted into UCD with co-funding from SFI and from industry. Bogdan's graduates are now being snapped up by industry and his research is now expanding into the very exciting area of quantum technology, supporting a growing Irish presence in this fast developing space. Another star working in this space in UCD is Elena Blochina, a former postdoctoral researcher in my own research group, and recently named as one of only two women internationally on a list of the top 51 CTOs transforming the world of global tech. Bogdan and Elena are examples of those who moved to Ireland, attracted by the leading edge opportunities in this country. The emergence of Ireland as a destination where talented individuals from around the world want to live and to grow their careers has been a transformative and vital underpinning of our industrial success. In 2020, almost 40% of new members of Engineers Ireland had been educated outside Ireland or the UK, up from 7% in 2014. Attracting these talented individuals to Ireland, retaining them here and supporting them to grow their careers here has to continue to be a priority. How does this talent pipeline look from the perspective of industry? I've spoken with many industry leaders over the years about this, as we always want to seek ways to improve. I spoke in more detail with a number of them in preparation for this address, and they all emphasised certain distinctive characteristics of their workforce in Ireland. Along with strong technical skills, they identified the strength of the communication skills and networking ability across the cohort, a willingness to innovate and to take initiative rather than waiting to be instructed, a responsiveness and adaptability. It does seem that there is a positive dynamic as people develop their careers within Irish industry that differs from that in many competitor countries. This is supported by the workplace culture as well as through formal supports, such as continuing professional development. And I again note the contribution of Engineers Ireland in this latter area. Very importantly, it is also reflective of a sense of creativity, a spark in Irish culture that is manifest across very, very many diverse aspects of our national life. 
As our industry base has grown in Ireland, the dispersal and resulting amplification of talent across the system has also become a feature, even in the face of setbacks. An industry le leader who worked with Digital Equipment Corporation told me how after their high profile closure, he counted 50 individuals in senior roles across the tech sector in Ireland who had come out of what was an excellent workforce at digital, growing success across the system. We've seen similar multiplicative impacts from companies in other sectors, such as Elan. Along with the technical talent on which we've been able to draw and indeed overlapping considerably with it, comes the managerial talent. Throughout our period of industrial transformation, we've had a number of really gifted individuals leading the Irish operations of major industries, bright and strategic thinkers who have identified and pursued to great effect opportunities to grow their business. A number of people have also commented to me on the quality of the middle management layer within companies in Ireland, comparing it favourably to that found in many of our competitors. One element that has contributed to this has been the development to world-class levels of business education in Ireland through institutions such as the UCD Smurfit School and the IMI. The strong links and transfers between engineering and management are also key here, as reflected in the new Executive and Business Society in Engineers Ireland. And there's also the talent pipeline not directly in Irish industry, but supporting it. This includes those in public service who played such a significant role in our transformation. And I think this is a point we should not lose sight of. We've had successive ministers and executives in government agencies, most particularly the IDA, who have understood and prioritised industrial opportunities and have been able to hold sway in boardrooms where FDI decisions are made. And we now often have within those international boardrooms exceptionally talented individuals who grew their career within the Irish operation of the company before taking on a broader corporate leadership role. I sometimes get to work with these individuals as they seek to give back to this country through sharing their time and expertise on the board of a research centre or a university advisory group. They represent an enormous and generous resource for Ireland. Today's equivalent of Sean's Keating, Sean Keating's key men then could possibly be pictured in discussions around boardroom tables in New York and California. And of course, they would no longer be just men. It is no coincidence that Ireland's dramatic industrial development came alongside an equally dramatic expansion of the role of women in Irish society and in the economy. An example of this expansion, as viewed through one remarkable life, could be seen on the sad passing earlier this year of Anne Reardon, a leader in the national technology sector. Her obituary described how on starting her career with the gas company in the 1960s, she had to fight to secure first a pay increase and then the right to apply for promotion, having been first told that both were for men only. She then had to fight again for the return to work to work after marriage, which was conceded only for a six month period. She eventually went on to serve as the highly influential first general manager for Microsoft in Ireland, as chair of Science Foundation Ireland and many other key roles. Imagine the talent that we would have lost had she, quite reasonably, conceded at one of those first hurdles. Looking at the ICT sector alone, we see many outstanding women who are serving or have served in the senior leadership of major companies in Ireland, including Katrina Hallahan and now Anne Sheehan following Anne Reardon at Microsoft, Julie Byrne at Nokia Bell Labs, Sonia Flynn at Facebook, Anne-Marie Holmes at Intel, Cathy Carney at Apple, Carolyn Lennon at Air, Fanula Meehan at Google, Regina Moran at Fujitsu, Sharon McCooey at LinkedIn, Sinead McSweeney at Twitter, Anne O'Leary at Vodafone and others. This is a level of female leadership that is not characteristic of the sector internationally. What can we read into this? I've had several conversations with women who compare the work environment for women in the tech sector in Ireland very favourably with that in Silicon Valley, but then that is not a benchmark to which we should be aspiring. We are fortunate that a number of those who connect and influence the sector, such as Anne O'Dea, founder of the highly influential technology news website siliconrepublic.com and events such as InspireFest and Future Human, have a passionate commitment to diversity and inclusion.
and the sector is much the better for this. Internationally, we see Irish women like Anne Kelleher and Lorraine Tuchel at the top table of firms like Intel and Google. Women now make up 30% and in some years more of the engineering intake at UCD. And yet, and yet, and yet. We can point to examples of progress which are real and important, but the fact remains that women are not represented in the engineering profession in Ireland at the level we would want in order to maximise our talent pipeline. For those of us who've been trying to affect change here for decades, this is deeply disappointing and a drag on national performance. This is an area in which we want to do better. We also need to attend to all the many aspects of diversity that go beyond gender. So the story of talent for Ireland is a multifaceted one. It is about attracting, retaining and developing talent in all roles. It is about the relationship between higher education, research and industry. It is about flows and feedback loops and amplification, about creativity and diversity. I think there will probably always be in any system like ours a nervousness about the health of the talent pipeline, given how essential it is to our success. But the responsiveness of the various parts of our system and our experience of developing distinctive talent over decades now will continue to stand to us. Looking at other factors that have driven the transformation of Ireland, another word I think has to be at the top of the list is delivery. For companies that have invested significantly in Ireland across all sectors, Ireland has delivered. Success has been built upon previous success, both within individual operations and nationally. An ESRI working paper in 2012 described how surveys of executives of newly arriving foreign companies indicate that their location decision has been strongly influenced by the fact that other key market players are already located in Ireland. We've seen repeatedly how a company will often introduce a process first in Ireland, knowing that all the relevant issues will be surfaced and problems ironed out in a culture of quality, of excellence and of regulatory compliance. This is a key aspect of Irish success, not just the volume of FDI companies nationally, but the longevity of their commitment based on a growing confidence in what they can deliver in Ireland translating into successive waves of investment. Success in process implementation led to mandates for process development and for the development of successive generations of products. Further mandates, such as for shared services, have also followed in many cases. Pete Nicholas, founder of Boston Scientific, said of Ireland, I came here to make products, but you wouldn't leave it at that. The trajectory is not always upwards, of course, and plants in Ireland have been casualties of corporate strategic shifts. Yet overall, the number of jobs lost has been more than compensated by jobs gained, with the latter generally, though not always, in higher end activities. The requirements of the FDI sector in Ireland also created business for and an upskilling of many local engineering services firms who also delivered. Leading edge expertise was built up nationally in the design and project management of sophisticated manufacturing plants. Firms built an expertise and a reputation in this way that allowed them to become global players. Many Irish companies that started off as suppliers into multinationals in Ireland have gone on to being exporters themselves. We have learned that Irish engineering capability is highly exportable. And many Irish engineers have led significant international infrastructure projects and developed manufacturing sites in new locations based on their experience nationally. Another underpinning of Irish success is the connectedness of our ecosystem. Business leaders can access one another and the other people they need to know. Knowledge is shared. Sectoral representative bodies are agile and influential. The triple helix of interactions between government and its agencies, industry and academia, works better in Ireland than in many other countries due to our scale and openness to networking. There were also major decisions and enablers. The importance of our entry into the European Economic Community in 1973 and the later introduction of the single market cannot be overstated. Bodies such as the Environmental Protection Agency and the Health Products Regulatory Authority won confidence domestically and internationally for the quality of their work. Infrastructure expanded beyond recognition. 
institutes such as the National Microelectronics Research Centre, now the Tyndall Institute, and NIBERT, the National Institute for Bioprocessing Research and Training, were established. Innovative programmes brought together researchers from higher education institutions with industry to enhance R&D capability nationally and attract global R&D investment. And then there are all the other elements of our national culture and society that feed creativity and imagination and make Ireland an exciting and desirable place to live and work for so many. This has been a vital element of our success. I think it's very interesting, though well beyond the scope of this address, to consider how our uh, industrial transformation has been reflected in our culture, and indeed vice versa. Claire Lynch says in her book Cyber Ireland, while large multinational companies such as Intel, Dell and Apple are pragmatically recognised for the employment opportunities they created in Ireland, little has been done to understand the corresponding imaginative shift they initiated. Another huge and important topic is the interplay between Ireland's economic and social transformations over this period, and Fintan O'Toole's book, as you would expect, is very strong on this. And then there were, of course, some elements of luck, of random happenstance or of accidents of time or geography. Pat McCarthy's book describes the case of John A. Mulcahy from Dungarvan, who fought in the Civil War, was interned for a year, before emigrating at the age of 17 to the United States. He had a highly successful career there that happened to take him to the board of Pfizer, where his input was crucial to the company's 1968 decision to locate at Ringeskiddy. Or there's the case of Wilhelm Schuler, whose Rathdrum facility was one of the earliest inward investments in pharma, and whose daughter Beata later said of this decision, my father was always afraid of the Russians coming. It was the Cold War in Germany after all. So when he was looking for a place to set up a new plant, we wanted to find something as far west as possible. Here, our peripheral location worked in our favour. Other elements of luck include our time zone, which works with both the United States and Asia, our temperate climate, and the fact that we speak English. And one element where we certainly did get lucky was in our timing. We advanced slowly through the 60s, 70s and 80s, moving up that first part of the exponential that looks slow in hindsight. We grew our education system and our talent pipeline, built our capability, and attracted those first companies in the ones and twos that would later attract others in the tens and hundreds. You too and Jack Charlton shone a spotlight on Ireland, which became a place where people wanted to live. All of these left us well positioned by the time of my lunch event in San Jose to capitalise on the technological opportunities, corporate reorganisations and turbocharged globalisation of the 1990s and into the new millennium. I remembered my primary school geography, re geography recently when Tuam native Danny McCoy of Ibeck sp spoke about the industrialisation of that town. Back when I was learning about it, the sugar factory employed about 250 full-time workers, along with a similar number of temporary workers during the seasonal campaigns for harv harvesting the sugar beet grown throughout the region. Those numbers are dwarfed today by the number employed in, in companies in Chewham, like French-owned Vallejo, who employ nearly a thousand in cutting-edge automotive technologies, building on the foundation in the town of the indigenous engineering company Connacht Electronics. Chewham is Vallejo's worldwide reference centre for vision systems and automated parking, and the company described it as one of the most innovative sites of the group. To repeat something I said earlier, the successes of such enterprise in Ireland represent an Irish success story. These are not dei ex machina. They draw on as they enhance the skills, the creativity, the diversity, the networks and the culture in Ireland. So where does all this position us now as we look to the next phase of our industrial policy? As the saying goes, what got us here won't get us there. That is particularly true at this time of change. A paper by Ellen Hazelcorn quotes an unnamed civil servant as saying, in relation to a previous Irish industrial policy decision, very possibly tongue in cheek, we are just opportunistic future grabbers. Are we? I don't believe so. And I certainly hope that we are not, because there are a number of possible futures out there on offer at the moment. And I'm not sure that opportunism will get us to the right one. 
it's a time to be strategic. In my experience, we are at our strongest when we address matters as a system, bringing all relevant minds to bear on identifying the way forward. And I believe that we need such a conversation now. We are not where we were in 1958, needing to rip up a long-standing policy and construct an entirely new one. We have an enormous amount on which to build, but we do need to think, drawing on our considerable expertise and a position that is the envy of many, about the elements that need to be in place to support future success. The first one of these that I would mention, because it needs to be at the forefront of our minds in every conversation of this nature, is sustainability. The reliable provision of energy, water and materials in ways that allow us as a country and the industries located here to meet our sustainability targets is an absolute essential. Sustainable industry practices are likewise essential. Adaptation to unavoidable elements of climate change and protection against extreme impacts. These will increasingly influence investment decisions. Digital and data infrastructure, including regulatory aspects, and defences against cyber threats are also vital. And then there are broader aspects of infrastructure and planning. Pre-pandemic, we were seeing strains on many elements of our infrastructure, including those linked most closely to quality of life. The experience of the past 18 months has thrown up new ways of working that will in many cases persist, supported by digital technologies. A possible weakening of the importance of place presents challenges, opportunities and questions. It is interesting to imagine what a creative response to these questions might yield. To flip a quotation from earlier, states must be built, but they must also be imagined. Ireland must continue to be a place where people want to live in a country of diversity and creativity. This depends on cultural and social factors as much as economic. And then there is the question of indigenous industry, which would merit an entirely separate address. Clearly, we have some great successes in indigenous industry and major sectors such as agri-food where indigenous enterprise is dominant. I expect that Vice President Ed Harty may have something to say about this sector when he is addressing us two years from now. Irish-owned manufacturing exporters grew their sales globally by over 80% between 2010 and 2019. Irish manufacturers employ over 150,000 people abroad, including more than 60,000 in the US and 25,000 in the UK. However, it has to be said that taken as a whole, we have not seen the evolution of our indigenous industries that we would want. The slower burn of early stage indigenous enterprise compared with the potential for big wins with foreign direct investment means that the product that we have built nationally for indigenous enterprise is not as successful as for FDI. This is another area in which we need to do better. Medtech, where 60% of the industry is indigenous, including many SMEs, provides an interesting model. Strong links with higher education and research, an ambitious entrepreneurial mindset, the Agile Bio-Innovate programme, multidisciplinary links, including those with clinicians, a significant clustering effect in the west of Ireland. These are all among the factors that have supported indigenous med tech success. The layering of digitalization onto other industry sectors, such as med tech, pharma, manufacturing and agri-food, represents a great opportunity for Ireland, playing to our strengths. We need to be prepared for this and other advances in areas such as quantum technology, earth observation, the bioeconomy, sustainable manufacturing, cell and gene therapy, and lots more. A key element of our response here will be ensuring a strong research system, funded to a level that allows us to compete, and addressing the questions not just of today, but of tomorrow. And as a country, we would have absolutely no hope of addressing these questions and charting a successful future without engineering. Engineering insight, engineering talent, engineering industry, engineering skill sets, engineering solutions. I hope that the voice of engineering and of Engineers Ireland will be strong and distinctive as we in Ireland make the strategic choices that will underpin our next phase of industrial development. One next step in this conversation is the Engineers Ireland National Conference on Wednesday the 13th of October, 
which is taking place online and is free to members as one of your member benefits. You will hear from a number of speakers who will play important roles as we take the next steps in the journey that I have discussed here, including engineers Leo Clancy, newly appointed CEO of Enterprise Ireland, Linda Doyle, newly appointed Provost of Trinity College Dublin, Paddy Hayes, newly appointed CEO of ESB, and Naomi Long, MLA, leader of the Alliance Party. The event kicks off with a fireside chat between myself and economist David McWilliams. I hope that you can join us, as I think it's going to be great. Finally then, to return to my starting point this evening, when I met Gordon Moore back in my Berkeley days, he asked me about my plans after graduation. I told him that I had just accepted a faculty position in University College Dublin, and he responded, that'll do. It was recently described to me how members of the IDA team charged with winning over visiting Intel executives in the 1980s for that bellwether investment went out of their way to pass under the Belfield flyover on their way back to the hotel in Ballsbridge, since it was the most impressive piece of road infra infrastructure they had with which to impress the visitors. I was assured that this story is true, and I hope so, because I love that image. I'm also very pleased that this is only one on a very long list of contributions of my alma mater and employer to the story of Irish industrial success. I was reflecting on this when I returned last week to my office overlooking the lake in the middle of the UCD campus, where I was repeatedly distracted by the volume of student chatter and laughter coming in my window. It was amazing. If there was a more exuberant and positive place in Ireland these past couple of weeks than Belfield, I would love to see it. It is this positivity that compelled me to build my career in higher education and research, which by their nature are continually looking to build a better future. It is also why I am so honoured to be president of Engineers Ireland, an organisation representing a profession that looks to deliver sustainable solutions for society. From that vantage point, the future at this disruptive time seems replete not with challenges, but with opportunities. I look forward to working with you all as we respond. Thank you, Gurmila Magriff. Thank you, Orla, and uh, let me be the first uh, on behalf of the audience here and those that are joining us online to congratulate you for that absolutely wonderful address. Um, I'm going to call John Power in a moment, but before I do, uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, to to submit questions at Director General at EngineersIreland.ie. There's a lot of food for thought in Orla's address. So just moving now, I'd like to call on John Power. John is the Vice President of Engineers Ireland, and John is going to propose the vote of thanks to the President. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much, Caroline. Um, thank you, President, for a wonderful and thought-provoking address. Uh, everybody here, and indeed everybody uh, logging in this evening from home. Um, you're all up there, we can't see you, but you can maybe see us. Um, had the privilege of listening to uh, and hearing a most wonderful and inspiring address. Uh, if I may, before proposing the official vote of thanks, briefly refer to some of the takes, some of my own takes uh, from the very many areas you covered this evening, Orla. You began referring to the opportunity in the early 90s um, which the mayor of San Jose spoke about. And my, you know, just how well did the engineering profession respond? Delivering on behalf of Ireland Inc. in the tech sector, the pharma sector, the med tech sector, and manufacturing sectors. You refer to TK Whitaker's economic development document and the economic miracle, and how it was delivered through visionary decisions, hard work, talented and committed individuals and much collaboration, and down in a very large way to engineers. Later referring to how engineers can and indeed must tell their story with pride. 
who later referred to the voice of engineering. How education has been transformed here in this country. In 1963, it's not really that long ago, only 4%, the privileged few, went to third level education. You talked about the minimal research in universities and that 80% of the engineers worked in the state sector, which was the opposite essentially of what happened in Europe. And most extraordinarily, five women engineers recorded in the 1966 census. An extraordinary number, considering that this year, 30% of the first year intake in engineering in UCD is female. You referenced the two building blocks that supported our economic development, tax and talent. I think we're all delighted you didn't dwell too much on the tax bit, but certainly the talent bit stood out, with talent being a significant differentiator for Ireland. The transferable, as well as the technical skills of our engineers, resulting from the very rounded education and formation they received in our college, and dare I say, none more so than your own alma mater, the communication skills, the networking ability, and the willingness to innovate and to take the initiative. Our outstanding technicians, sometimes perhaps too often forgotten, are a vital resource. You reminded us of the dramatic expansion of the role of women in Irish society and in the economy, referring, of course, to the late Anne Reardon. You also mentioned another aspect of the Irish success being the connectedness of our ecosystem, as well as the creativity and imagination that make Ireland such an exciting place to live and work for so many people. You also acknowledged the occasional lucky break we enjoyed, referring to Johnny Mulcahy's rise to the top in Pfizer and the company's 1968 decision to locate and ring a skiddy. I have to refer to here John A. Mulcahy is very affectionately referred to in Kerry as Jack Mulcahy. And he also, of course, developed a very significant industry for us in Waterville. You so correctly pointed out that in these times of change, what got us here won't get us there. And referred to the need for us to be strategic in our quest for future success. We heard about delivery and the critical importance of sustainability and all that entails and the broader aspects of infrastructure and planning. The need for the evolution of our indigenous industries and how the most successful medtech sector provides us with the most interesting model. And the President's final comment again highlights the fact that in these most disruptive times, the future is replete not with challenges but with opportunities, which of course brought us right back to the comment from the mayor of San Jose when he mentioned opportunity as you opened your presidential address. It is now my great pleasure to propose the vote of thanks that the best thanks of Engineers Ireland be extended to the president for her address. And I request her permission, your permission, to have the address recorded in the transactions. And if I now may call on Majella Henshin to second the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, John, and I'll try and hold the microphone up at the right height. Okay. Uh, President, it is an honour to get the opportunity to add my voice of thanks to John's on behalf of all of us who've listened so intently and with great interest uh, to your address this evening. I believe you have made a truly strong case that Ireland is more than the Isle of Saints and Scholars, but um, one that dared to imagine and engineer uh, her own place in the modern world. With a very short history, we're not even a hundred years a nation, um, but that you also made that case that now we need to imagine and build further to secure the sustainable future for our society that we all want. Um, Look, there were so many gems that I'm not going to even try to, uh, to cover off your, 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 your speech. I'm going to talk about three things that really resonated with me personally, okay? So first of all, um, Jack Mulcahy was referenced. You referenced our diaspora. Um, and I think we all really need to recognize 
how big and important the diaspora is. Um, and I think you also underplayed your own role as a member of the diaspora who, you know, are on the cusp of a great career, is meeting uh, the leader in your area. And when they asked, what were you going to do with all the opportunities that were open to you standing there in Silicon Valley, you said, I'm going back to Ireland to educate the next generation and potentially the generations to come. That resonated so much with me because uh, both my brothers uh, from the same alma mater graduated in the 80s, went abroad, came back in the 90s. But also, I have the great honor of working for uh, a big state institution, the ESB, founded by a member of the diaspora, uh, an NUIG engineer who went to work for Siemens um, and could have had the most stellar, amazing career there working for Siemens. But instead, he worked with the people he knew there, the people he knew here, and he envisaged the ESB the Ardena Crushes scheme, the pictures you talked about, a foundation block for all of us uh, to realise the, the future that you have so eloquently outlined. Um, but that you know, brings me naturally actually on to the second point that resonated so deeply, which was your colleagues and the members of Engineers Ireland who are not Irish, but who choose to work here and who have been attracted here quite often by that diaspora who talk so fondly of home and of the wonderful place it is to live and be in. Um, and as the, the chair of our new Inclusion and Diversity Society, I hope that we can really work well to help make sure that life here in Ireland and working here in Ireland is exciting and as interesting and full of fun as we promised those people when we encouraged them to come here. Um, but that does you know, also mean that I have to look at the other aspect of diversity, which you talked about, um, and your lament that despite great, great efforts and a huge amount of um, work, we still haven't really succeeded in increasing women's representation in engineering. We have some wonderful examples, yourself included, but we have a lot more to do, and I, I really join with you in saying we must do better. I do draw inspiration from the 30% in UCD, I draw a lot of inspiration from the fact that other countries are doing really well at this. But that's also a major area for concern for us. Because those countries and the companies that we've built this future that Orla has outlined to us are, are, know the value of diversity. And they will go where they can get diversity. Really concerning recently was seeing Pat Gelsinger, CEO of Intel, say, I love Ireland but you have far too few female engineers. We have to double down, we really have to get this right. But you know what? With that imagination and engineering, we can and we will, and we will make a difference. And maybe that's what above all I got from your, your talk, is we have hope. You've made it clear that our current circumstances were not pure luck, that they derived from, as you said, visionary decisions, hard work, talented and committed individuals, and multiple elements of a connected system pulling together. And we still got all of that. Um, and I know that if we tackle the challenges facing us now with that same vision and spirit, we can deliver the inclusion and diversity we must, and we can deliver the sustainable society that we desire to hand down to the next generation and all the generations to come. So I have great pleasure in seconding the vote of thanks for an excellent, most interesting address. And I ask both our virtual and our physical audience to join with me in expressing our appreciation to the president. And now I'd like to call on our Vice President John Power and President Orla Feely to return to the stage for the question and answer session. Thank you.
President, again, um, thank you. I, I don't think my mic was on for the first session that I was up here on. Sorry about that. Um, but thank you again for your wonderful address. Uh, we've come to the, the Q&A session, and I'm, I'm quite sure we could be here for a number of hours this evening answering questions from those in the room and those who have joined, joined us um, uh, uh, remotely. Uh, and again, just to remind people, if they do have questions, um, that they could uh, send them to director general at engineersireland.ie. Um, now, for those here in the room, if I could ask you, if you have a question, to, to raise your hand, uh, just hold until the microphone is brought to you, introduce yourself, and then ask the question, if you wouldn't mind, please. So at that point, I'm going to open it up for any questions, and maybe we'll start here in Tide Road. Uh, Orla, how do you feel about the, you know, the, the twin aspects of data centers and the future in Ireland and you talk about sustainability being at the forefront too? There definitely seems to be an emerging clash in the economic clash with the sustainability clash. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. And I suppose my thoughts are, you know, I, I, I wouldn't claim to have the answer on this one. There are many people far more expert than I am in Engineers Ireland who can contribute to that. My point is that this is a strategic choice and we need to address it as a strategic choice, not kind of drift in one way or the other, but decide bringing to, be to bear all the expert voices uh, from within the country, all the interested parties, to make a conscious decision as to what way we're going to take these things forward. So it's not a direct answer, but it's, I, I, I think, an important element that I don't think we have always been uh, delivering in our response to these opportunities. Again, that, that, that quote, which I hope was tongue in cheek, we are just opportunistic future grabbers. We can't just be that. I think we have a second question here, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, and uh, congratulations, Orla, on a really stimulating speech. Peter Brown from the Irish Research Council here. Um, as you know, there's a, a new research and innovation strategy that's in development and is going to be the Department of Further and Higher Education, Research and Innovation Science are, are leading on that. And obviously enterprise development is a key part of the framework for that, the health of the research system, um, and, and probably most of all societal and global challenges. But I'm just interested from an engineering point of view, um, what, like what, what would you like that strategy to deliver um, from, from an engineering perspective? And I suppose my engineering perspective doesn't differ too much from my broader perspective. Um, first of all, we need, and I think I, I, I've said this in my words, we need to be looking at the questions not just of today, but also of tomorrow. So we need to be future-proofing our system. We have to cover research across all areas, across the spectrum from very, very fundamental to applied. Um, I would love to see us centre talent development in our research. Talent development is one of the key, if not the key, outputs that you get from funding research in a country like Ireland. So suppose we said in our new system, it's all about talent development. You know, let's make every decision governed by how best we can develop research talent. I think that would be a really interesting way to look at how we fund research. Um, I think, again, that question of joining up. You know, we, as you know well, Peter, at one point we had an advisory science council did a great job. We don't have that kind of function at the moment. And I think that we've been feeling the lack of it for some years now. Um, and just the final thing I would mention is infrastructure. I think that, you know, our, our research infrastructure and indeed our infrastructure in many higher education laboratories has fallen way behind the times in recent years. I would love to see a commitment to invest in infrastructure. And I think that could be quite, I, I would hope, quite an easy case to make. Thanks. Thank you, Orla. I think we have a question from Regina. <clears throat> Hi, Orla. That was an amazing address. I enjoyed every moment of it, actually. Um, just back to the topic, I suppose, of, of girls in engineering, uh, close to my heart as well. Um, one idea that we were working on is the idea of actually influencing at primary level education and influencing the educators, because many of the primary school teachers are not from engineering backgrounds and there's quite a lot of female teachers in, in primary schools. Do you have any thoughts on that? Can we, can we maybe shift the dial a bit earlier uh, in, the, in the lives of young girls? I, I, I think everything is worth a try. Um, I, I know some initiatives, 
initiatives that have been underway in primary schools, but you know we're clearly not not managing to turn the dial. I think looking at other countries, as Magella said, there you know other countries. You know we're not awful in Ireland at this, and in fact many of our numbers hold up very well, and many aspects of our culture hold up very well. Um, but we want to do better. We want to be among the best. Um, and, you know, I look back when I joined UCD for a number of years, I was the only woman on the faculty there in engineering. Now we have Aoife Hearn, who's here, who's the college principal in engineering and architecture in UCD. Architecture in UCD. Amanda, who's the head of civil engineering. We have full professors. We have European Research Council grant holders. At every level now in UCD, we have outstanding women uh, delivering engineering education. So, so we're making progress. Um, but, but let's just, again, maybe just get, get people around the table again and try to think a bit more. This is a tough one for me because we've, we've been committed to this agenda for so long. And we have moved the dial and, and the numbers have ticked up. I think this year, 30%, sometimes it's more than 30% in first engineering in UCD. But you know, we're, we're, we're still not making the kind of progress that we would like to have made. So let's get around the table, look at the idea you suggest. Let's look at what other countries are doing and let's see how we can do better here. Thank you very much, President. I, I'm, I'm going to take one that was, was, that was, that was uh, sent in to us from Donald O'Brolicon. Uh, thank you for this evening's address. It's, it's a rather long one, but we'll, we'll get to it. While it's clear that engineers have played a, a major role in transformations since independence, I wonder to what extent, if any, engineers have failed to provide checks and balances on the whimsies of the governing networks, e.g. Um, enhancing public transport in the Greater Dublin area, lack of investment in the water services, late start in planning for an investment in renewable energy, uh, enhancing STEM education, um, downplaying ap apprenticeships and favouring more formal academic based entry to engineering related work. There's a lot in that. So. And I, I'll answer it very briefly because I think it goes back to a comment I made earlier. It, it's about the engineering voice being clear and distinctive and strong. And I think, you know, we, we have to, you know, examine our own consciences and, and see, you know, are we always strong and unified and, and clear in what we want to say and in how we feed into these discussions? I think Engineers Ireland is a wonderful way of doing that. I, I, I'd love to see us you know, become uh, more strategic, more influential, get around those tables more often. So I, I, I think the point is well made that, you know, there are times at which the engineering voice has not been heard when these big decisions are being taken and we need it there. Well done. Thank you, President. Was there another place? Uh, Mary, Mary Sharp. Yeah. Mary Sharp, uh, with all the um, industry and the data centres at the moment, they're having an effect on the environment. Uh, do you think there is a strategic plan for that at all at the moment? Because I think we certainly need one. Um, I agree we do. And, and you know, there, 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 are, there, there are without question people working very hard on our sustainability targets and obligations. So without question, we do have an awful lot of work going on in that. Engineers Ireland, of course, has done a huge amount of work in laying out our stall in sustainability. So yes, I think that there are very engaged actors in this field trying to advance us to where we all know we need to get to. Um, maybe a bit more joining up, I think, could help. Jerry, can I come to you in a moment? I just, I just take one more here, if you don't mind, uh, from, from Charles Smith. What can we, as Engineers Ireland, do to ensure a multidisciplinary response to the issues to be discussed at the National Conference to get the best progress <clears throat> with the problems that we all face globally and nationally? Well, a good first step is to come to the National Conference, which is a, a wonderful offering, free to members as one of your member benefits. We've got a great lineup. You heard there are people like Leo Clancy, Linda Doyle, uh, Paddy Hayes, uh, Naomi Long, and David McWilliams kicking it off. Really, I think, interesting speakers who have a lot to say about uh, wh where Ireland is now headed in a multitude of fields. So I would love to have a really lively and vibrant conversation on that day. It'll all be online, of course, but that's fine. We're all used to that now. So let's kick off the conversation there. Well, so Charles, we look forward to your, to your um, uh, input to that discussion at the conference. So thank you for the question. Uh, Jerry. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, President, for a really superb, excellent uh, presentation and uh, very, very extremely thought-provoking. Uh, I, I heard a presentation last week from one of the board members of BASF, 
and uh, the discussion was around disruption. You know, so I think you mentioned all the disruption is is is, is really is really there, and it's, it's it's coming even more and more uh, with all the various with digitalization and then sustainability. She was making the point that business success going forward and value creation fundamentally will change. Uh, so business success today. Uh, if it means uh, success of the business, you know, uh, but business success tomorrow means uh, success with the value creation in terms of value of the environment, value to society, and then also value to the business. So there's, it's a much more complex uh, scenario. So we're really facing into huge complexities as we go forward, which is a word that as engineers, I think we often like. So we're facing into a very, very exciting time. But yet, uh, I think there can be fear in the system as well. So it's uh, so we're facing into that scenario. So just interested to hear, would that be would that concur with your thinking uh, on let's say the triple thing of business success being environment, societal, and then also the success in the in the conventional business sense? I, I, I think very much so. Um, and a, a place where I take great hope and. Jerry, you, you like me, you know, built most of your career within higher education, and we've got Aoife there leading our higher education in, in, in UCD engineering education at the moment. Um, it's that generation, you know, the, the, the approach of, of our current generations of students, they would not tolerate an approach that did not have sustainability at its core. They are creative thinkers, they are disruptive thinkers, they are new thinkers. So that for me is one of the things that I love about being in higher education. The fact that you have this window into the ideas and the creativity of tomorrow. So I would be very optimistic about our ability to tackle the multifaceted challenges that you described there. I'm going to take one more question from the room, if there is one. Now, unfortunately, time is coming against us, so one last quick question. I'm not an auctioneer, but it's going, <laughs> going, and it's gone. President, thank you very, very much. Much appreciated. Thank you, John. Thank you, Magella. And thank you all for attending either in person here or online. I thank the audience for the reception given to my address, and I agree, agree with pleasure to the request that it be published in the transactions. I wish to thank you all for viewing and listening to our presidential address of 2021. This meeting of Engineers Ireland is now concluded. Good night and thank you very much.